Our next speaker is synonymous with Medjugorje, and uh, as Sister Breege was saying, people often say, do you believe in Medjugorje? It was in 1988 in Medjugorje I came into the Divine Mercy. A lady, I was at 10 o'clock mass there. I didn't go to see any sun spinning or anything else. And a lady came up to me after 10 o'clock mass and she said to me, you know, you have to stop wrestling with God and just do his will. It took me about 30 years to take that on board, but <laughs> I finally got into it, I think, I hope. But in uh, Medjugorje that week, I, as I said, I had faith. I just went for peace, really. Two friends had been killed in tragic circumstances, two of my best friends. And I was angry with God, and I didn't know what he was at. So I went just looking for peace and to restore my peace. But during that week, on the Wednesday, this lad I was with came to me and said, um, he says, I volunteered you to carry a young girl up to the apparition room at a quarter to seven. Now everybody was saying, oh, fantastic. Do you know how lucky you are? And I was looking at the task to be done. And I said, why didn't you carry her up yourself, you know? <laughs> I said, how would you volunteer me? He said, wait, you feel the weight of her. <laughs> And as true as God, a little four-year-old girl, uh, she had fallen in a swimming pool and she was, um, she, she was literally a vegetable. She couldn't speak or see. Uh, she was, you know, her brain wasn't functioning. She was literally now, uh, it, was, it was a very touching encounter. But uh, I met the lady and I carried her up to the apparition room at a quarter to seven. And just before the apparition started, and people say, well, do you believe in apparitions? But I'll just tell you my experience, and, uh, you, you know, you can judge for yourselves. But uh, just before the apparition started, little girl, and I have a, uh, I had a, girl, a, li I have a little girl as well. well. She's 29 now, but a little Audrey. And I said, if this was my Audrey, what would I like somebody to do? So I put, knelt down on the floor and put my hands under her head because it was a slab floor. And... Father Slavko said to the nurse that was with her and her mother, he said, would you like, would you like uh, to kneel down before the apparition starts? And the medical professional, the nurse says, she says, I'm a medical professional, she says. Uh, I'm not here for to do your Catholic thing. Uh, you go ahead and kneel down if you like, and, but nothing to do with me. And the mother, Linda, said, she says, well, I'm the same, she says, I'd... Uh, if you don't mind, you know, we'll stand. So when the apparition started, both of the ladies were thrown to the floor. I was already on the floor, <laughs> on my hands and knees with me, hands under her head, and my whole body was gone like somebody had plugged me into a 10,000-volt generator. That little girl's name was a girl called Audrey Santos, Audrey will more than likely be beatified either next year or the following year. She wasn't healed, but when she went back to her home in Cape Cod, that people would come to her with cancer and brain tumours and all sorts of tumours and illnesses. And little Audrey would take on those tumours and in two days, three days, the tumour would be gone. So word got round and then eventually... They had to hire Yankee Stadium in New York to house all the people that wanted to come to see her. They brought her on a stretcher out into the middle of Yankee Stadium and they held a healing service. And as I say, that's in a book called In God's Hands, if anybody wants to read it, but it's a true story and that people say, you've actually held a saint in your hands, you know? And I says, well... I didn't go looking for anything, but that was one of the experiences that I had and that it doesn't matter what anybody you tell me, you're, you're hearing that from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So for Medjugorje, yes, I think it's fantastic to see all the people going to confession. It's a brilliant place and I fully believe in it. And that leads me on to our next speaker, that this man, in fact, was 
uh, one of the people that's synonymous with it. He's been there bringing, uh, as a, a guide, bringing pilgrims round for the last, I won't say how many years, Philip, but uh, he's a man that's really known to everybody and great character and uh, has great stories from his own experience. So please put your hands together for Mr. Philip Ryan. Hello, everybody. It is a huge privilege and an honor to be here today. And for those who have been to Medjugorje, in my mind, I'm standing at the Blue Cross to make it easier for me to talk to so many people all at once. But can I ask how many people have been to Medjugorje? Would you raise your hands? Oh, my God. Wow. We're in Medjugorje. <laughs> Well done. We've been asked to pray. Father Joe's testimony was incredible. And Sister Bridge, when I was told, uh, was asked to come to the conference, I understood from Don that I was coming to hold the microphone for Sister Bridge. Uh, I didn't know I was speaking. Perhaps we pray together as we start. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. And the Word was made flesh. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray. For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we doom the incarnation of Christ thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us, and may the souls of the faithful and departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Our Lady Queen of Peace and Our Lady of Fatima in the name of the Father, Son. Well, I'm Philip Ryan and I'm from Tala in Dublin and I have spent the last 26 years of my life guiding Irish pilgrims through what for me has become the most extraordinary privilege, and that is to work with you, pilgrims that come and are brought and carried and invited by the heart of Our Lady to this very special place. What's even more special for me is that I'm 26 years there and I'm only 29. <laughs> I wish. When I was preparing for today, my heart, my thoughts, I came across a, a beautiful little piece about Pope John Paul II, which Sister Bridge has also mentioned when he prophesied at his homily in Philadelphia. But when he came to Ireland, to our beloved Ireland, and he went to Knock, in his homily at the Grotto of Knock, he said this, recently I have been to Guadalupe, I have also been to Yasnagora to visit the Black Madonna. Three weeks ago, he said, I have been to Loreto in Italy. And now, today, I come here because I want all of you to know that my devotion to Mary unites me in a very special way with the people of Ireland. 
Saint Pope John Paul II wanted to unite himself to you and me and to our country, and he did it through the heart of Mary. We are here today in the heart of Mary. Our pilgrimage to the ODS, our pilgrimage to this conference for today, if you're here for, for both days and for the weekend, was an invitation from the mother to be with her son. St. Louis de Montfort once said, the surest, fastest, easiest way to the heart of Jesus is through the heart of Mary. You and me know that. And today Our Lady has spent all day today gathering us. You've come from every corner of Ireland. Some of you have maybe stayed overnight last night. We are pilgrims here in the ODS, pilgrims of divine mercy. And it was beautiful for, the, for those who set out yesterday. Yesterday was the feast of Blessed Jacinta and Francisco, the little saints of Our Lady of Fatima. Lent has started. We're on a wonderful journey of grace already since last Wednesday. And tomorrow, I only read, marks a very special day in the life of St. Faustina. Because tomorrow will be the anniversary when she first saw Jesus as the divine mercy. The one and only time she saw our Lord as divine mercy when she was in Poland. All the other apparitions were in Vilnius. So between yesterday and the intercession that we carry here today of Francesco and Jacinta and tomorrow that image which I will share a little bit more about you tomorrow that image that was given to her of Jesus divine mercy is the day we gather again tomorrow at this conference we are truly in a place of grace and we come here today seeking God many of you have, will have heard me share at the Blue Cross in Medjugorje I give you permission to go asleep now because I'm going to share something I've shared before. <laughs> Father Slavko of Medjugorje, a priest who was sent to Medjugorje in 1982 to uncover the truth, a doctor of psychology, a doctor of the mind. He spent 18 years in Medjugorje, a local priest. And in those 18 years, Our Lady made him really and truly a doctor of the heart. He had the most wonderful way of explaining the message of Our Lady, the message of the Gospel, of bringing people to the sacraments, especially confession, who had absolutely no wish to go, no intention to go. He was a huge gift. But in one homily I recall him giving, he said, why do we get so shocked at apparitions? He said, throughout the history of God's relationship with us, his people. God has chosen certain places. He has chosen certain times in order to come closer to us. St. Faustina was one of those people. The Divine Mercy. Fatima, our own beloved Nak. Medjugorje, I truly believe. Although the documents from Medjugorje rest beautifully on the desk of Pope Francis. I speak, as, as Don mentioned, out of my own experience of Medjugorje. But Father Slavko said, those places, those times, those people that God sent to us is a sign that God is seeking us. Our coming here today to this conference is a sign of you and me putting our weekend aside as we seek God. We are God seekers these days. We have a mission. A mission to bring God deeper into my life. For anybody here today who doesn't know the Divine Mercy, perhaps this weekend was organized just for you. For those who have been here before, it is an invitation to rest with Jesus. It's an invitation of the mother 
to spend time with her son. God is seeking us. And what a wonderful gift you and I are at this conference. We are a gift to the mother. We are a gift to Jesus that we found a place in our lives and we came aside to listen, to open our hearts, perhaps our hearts of anger or hurt. There's no doubt for nearly all of us, I'm sure, stress brought us here. The stress of life, the stress of family, the stress of the economy, stress, stress, stress. And Father Slavko used to say the importance of, of being a pilgrim. He said, we can't overestimate it. When we become a pilgrim, he would say, we create a holy environment. We enter a holy environment. We join others. We are surrounded by others who are seeking God. So together, we are united. And then, as those days pass, that environment that we are soaked in enters us. And we are able to go back into an unholy environment sometimes with that presence within us, that holy place alive, a place that feeds us, a place that strengthens us, a place that renews us. And we are given a very special gift, a gift that the Celtic tiger, in my opinion, robbed us of. It gave us many great things, there's no doubt. I'm not an economist, I'm not a politician. I was living in Medjugorje all those years. There was no doubt there was wonderful things happening. But on a spiritual level, it robbed us of being able to see life with the eyes of our hearts. That is a grace. That is a grace that we need if we are going to live and be witnesses of the divine mercy, of our faith, of our church, of our God. Perhaps that's why Our Lady, the Mother, gathered us here this weekend. She gathered us here to renew that inner vision. The visionaries say when they see Our Lady, when St. Faustina saw Our Lord, it wasn't just a spiritual vision. They physically saw Our Lady, Our Lord. They could touch them. And that's the gift Our Lady wants for us, is to see God is here. God is alive. And you and me, by what we sometimes think is our small, insignificant life, it's not. I was very struck when Sister Breed was sharing about St. Faustina, that when St. Faustina would be writing her diary, trying to catch a few minutes here and a few minutes there to compile this extraordinary diary for you and me, when she was writing it, Jesus was already thinking of you and me. He was already knowing that this diary would be so that you and I could know what we need to know. That he could share himself with us. That he could bring meaning, his meaning, into our lives and into the lives of our families. What struck me too about St. Faustina, she spoke much to Our Lady. Our Lady seemed to come to her when she was particularly troubled or afraid. How many times our Lord had to tell St. Faustina, do not be afraid. I will carry you. I will give you the strength. I will lead you. In one conversation that Our Lady had with St. Faustina, Our Lady said to her, I am the mother to all of you. Thanks to the unfathom, unfathomable mercy of God, most pleasing to me is the soul that carries out the will of God. Be courageous. Do not fear apparent obstacles, but fix your gaze upon the passion of my son, and in this way you will be victorious. We have done that. Our Lady, as the mother 
gathered us. We are in this moment fulfilling God's will by being here. For God's will is always that we have him in the first place in our lives. When God is in the first place, everything else will be in the right place. And that was something that really touched me when I had the privilege only once to sit in the chapel in Krakow where St. Faustina saw our Lord. What I hadn't known, and this was a beautiful article, the great apostle of Divine Mercy, Val Conlon, once wrote an article, uh, I think it was in the Medjugorje Herald, he wrote it, but in it he shared that St. Faustina was confused. She had joined the convent to have a life of prayer and adoration, and instead she was across the courtyard from that adoration chapel in the kitchen or in the laundry, busy, hot, noisy, sticky, smelly, all the things the kitchen and the laundry can be, and her heart would long to be with her Jesus in adoration. So she decided one night that she would pray, and in that prayer she would find the confidence to go to Mother Superior tomorrow to tell her she was going to seek a new order, a new community who would give her that desire. And that night Jesus came to her and he said to her, but I ask you not to leave for this is where I have prepared the most grace for your life. And she didn't leave. And I sat in that chapel and I was overcome by that extraordinary encounter to sit somewhere where she sat. And it struck me that when we pray, we are where we're meant to be. And for you and me, sometimes it can feel, although we pray, we go to Holy Mass, we pray our rosaries, we fall asleep, and we we wake up at two o'clock and we don't know, are we at the start of the rosary or at the end of the rosary? We say the second joyful mystery 20 times, we'll be trying to... (laughs) I said those rosaries. I'm sure St. Faustina said those rosaries. I know that St. Monica, the mother of St. Augustine, said those rosaries, praying for the conversion of her son. I think St. Augustine was Irish. (laughs) He was praying, convert me, Lord, but not yet. And his mammy was praying, convert him now. (laughs) And he did convert. I'm sure those nights where she fell asleep, as we have done, wondering... Where is God in all of this? Where is God's plan for me, for my kids, for my family, for my marriage, for my sons, my grandkids? Where are you, God? And God called out to St. Faustina and he directly answered her confusion as he does ours. If I think I'm, I'm in a place right now where I don't need or want to be, today at this conference we can give that to Jesus. When St. Faustina was confused at night and praying that would she leave, would she find a new convent, all she wanted to be was a good nun, a better nun. And Jesus must have been looking at her and thought, I have bigger plans for you. You will be my saint. God has huge plans for you and me. And in our confusion sometimes and in our doubts lies the path to our sainthood. Wouldn't it be wonderful one day in the litany of saints that all your names were written down? Why not? There's many grandparents that I have met in Medjugorje. I wish sometimes that they had a camera attached, what they call them, GoPro, to their forehead so that their own children or their own grandchildren could see with how much faith and love They are praying for their kids or their grandkids. And those grandparents and those parents are you. God walks with you. When Pope John Paul went to Lourdes for the last time, he went as a pilgrim. I already mentioned his own affection for us, the people of Ireland, and our love for Our Lady that united him at that shrine. But he went with a great affection to Our Lady of Lourdes. He went now as a very sick man. He was dying. 
His, his Parkinson's was very advanced. His hand was very badly shaking. And when they turned him to face the grotto at her, of Our Lady at Lourdes, he had a bishop and his secretary on each side of him. And the, you know that chair that he had that would raise him? It looked like he stood, but in fact, it was raising his seat. But to their surprise, he did not want to stay sitting down. Shaking, he wanted to stand, and they grabbed his, his elbows, and they shuffled him to a kneeler. And our beloved Pope went on his knees, and he put his head into his hand, and he was lost with Our Lady. In that moment with the mother, he was crying. You could see on the cameras tears in his eyes from the moment or from pain. But when they sat him back into his chair and they turned him and he faced the crowd like this and at the front were people in wheelchairs, people in stretchers, all of the sick laid out before him. And he put down his speech for a moment and he looked at all the sick and he said, I come as one of you. I come as a sick one, he said. And then he looked at everybody and he said, walk with Mary. You can count on her. Ten days later, on the 25th of August, Our Lady spoke a message in Medjugorje, and one sentence in that message, Our Lady said, pray for the strength to kneel before God. And the first picture I had in my head was Pope John Paul II kneeling at the grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes in agony, but he was in the presence of the mother whom he loved, taught us to us, totally yours. He knelt before her. And then as a pope and as a priest and as a man who survived labor camp, communism, and now was pope, he was inviting you and me on the most wonderful journey. Take the hand of Mary and walk with her because you can count on her. For all of us here today, and for all of you men at this conference, for all of us, Ireland today, the message to fathers and to young men who want to live their faith is, are you wasting your time or what? It's an awful message. But you're coming to this conference. This is an act of greatness. This is what defines you and me as men of faith. This is us knowing and having the strength to kneel before our God. This is walking with Mary. It was, I think, Father Gabriel Harty, the Dominican rosary priest, who once said that when you take the hand, when you take the rosary in your hand, you take the hand of Mary. In all my years in Medjugorje, I must be very stubborn or a slow student of Our Lady because she has me on pilgrimage for 26 years already. But I have got to witness and had the privilege to see in you as pilgrims that when you take the rosary in your hand, you take more, more than the hand of Our Lady. You hold in your hand her heart. You hold in your hand the attention of all of heaven. When we speak to heaven and say, Hail Mary, heaven stops to listen to you and me, invoking the intercession the most powerful intercession there is. It's the intercession of Mary before her son. And I was once giving a talk to five-year-olds. I had given a talk to 18-year-olds uh, in a school in Ireland. When I went to give my talk, I was asked by the religious ed teacher, who are you? And I said, Philip from Medjugorje. What? And I said, it's a shrine. Are you a priest? I said, no. He said, what are you speaking about? Our Lady. Oh, dear God, he said. <laughs> they won't listen. I got all agitated. And he said to me, if they start heckling you, it's normal. 
But if they start throwing things at you, the talk is over, he said. And I said to him before he rushed out to make this announcement that I was going to speak, he, I said, I have some miraculous medals that I brought from Medjugorje that were blessed in an apparition and blessed by a priest. And can I give them to the students? And he said, good luck with that. I spoke to them. I spoke for the half hour. And at the end, I told them I had some medals. Would anybody like one? I had 300 medals with me. And I had 120 students. And I didn't have enough medals. They all wanted one for Mary or Johnny or Granny or Daddy or somebody else who was sick. And even the teacher stood back. It was nothing to do with my talk so much as when Our Lady speaks to the heart, she speaks as a mother. She knows our hearts. She knows what makes us afraid. She knows what disturbs us. She knows who disturbs us because she loves them too. She walks with us. She never gets tired loving us. She's incapable of anything else but just loving us. And as I was preparing for today and coming to understand that more, the theme of this conference, Forgive Us Our Trespasses, I was trying to say in myself, how do I understand that? And I began to understand that when I know that I am loved, then I know that I am forgiven. And in the Our Father, we seek that forgiveness. But in seeking that forgiveness, we shouldn't ever forget that that forgiveness is offered with so much love. We are loved. And we're seeking that love always. Father Slavko used to say, one of the most important gifts in life is peace, he would say. In fact, he said, peace is so important that if there's no peace, there's no growth. And he would stand in front of pilgrims in his brown habit, and he would say to the pilgrims, what's the difference between me as a Franciscan before you? And then he would stand to the side, and he would say, and this man beside me, who is a drug addict, what's the difference between the two of us? And then he would answer it. He said, the difference is, I sought my peace here, and I found it. And my friend, the drug addict beside me, he sought his peace here, in his veins. And for a moment he thought he found it, but then the drug would destroy him. It would take even the little peace he had before he started searching for it. He said, Father Slavko, we are conceived in our mother's wombs with a need and a desire for peace. And that need and a desire for peace is behind every decision you and I will ever make, Father Slavko said. Where we live, our friends, even our job, our schools, our college, we think, will it, will it bring me peace? Will my neighbors bring me peace? Will I find peace? And in our mother's wombs, Father Slavko would say, blessed is the mother who knows that she is loved. Because when she's loved and safe and secure, baby feels that. And baby thrives. But the mother who has her peace taken from her, who doesn't feel safe or loved or secure, baby feels that. And that baby is born now with a much greater struggle to find peace. I remember when Father Slavko shared that, I was very struck. Because Sky News, a short time later, did a piece where they traveled to Australia. And they tra traveled there to meet a couple whose baby was now five months old, this gorgeous boy, chubby cheeks, standing on his daddy's lap, and he kept trying to grab the interviewer's microphone. He was loving the attention, cameras, lights, and mammy and daddy were asked to share about his birth. When he was born in the hospital, in one of the most eminent hospitals in Australia, with 
some of the most eminent doctors present for the delivery. The doctors were baffled. They could not stabilize the child's heartbeat. And there was awful panic in the delivery room. And doctors were being called from cardiac units, pediatric doctors, all being pulled down to this intensive care unit. And this baby's heartbeat would not settle. They were losing the baby. And finally, after apparently an hour and a half, two hours, they turned to the parents. They handed the baby to the parents and said, there's nothing more we can do. And they laid the baby on the mother's chest. And the midwife who was present went running around turning off the screens and the volume so that when the heartbeat stopped, they wouldn't hear it. And as they lay baby there, the the nurse just said to the parents, if you pray, this is a good time. Talk to your son. So the father knelt down. He said it was the first time he'd ever prayed with his wife. He didn't even know what to pray. They named their baby. And he began to talk to his son. Tell him all the football games they were going to have. All the great things they were going to do. The mammy began to pray and she began to sing to her little boy. And with the midwife behind the screens, she saw the baby's heartbeat starting to find a rhythm. And after another hour and a half, she went over to the parents and she said, keep doing what you're doing. An hour later, the baby, the heart was totally stabilized. He was incubated. And now he was five months old, standing on mommy and daddy's lap, fully recovered. I had to think of Our Lady in that moment. I had to think of the words of Father Slavko in that moment. When the doctors lay that baby on her chest, and what Father Slavko had said about us hearing our mother's heartbeat in our mother's wombs for nine months, that sound is the rhythm of life. When the baby was laid on the mammy's chest, Did he say, God, I know that sound. I remember that. Did he connect his little heart to the heartbeat of his mother and find his peace? All the doctors were baffled and nobody else could do anything to save him. And a mother's heartbeat intervened. And perhaps in our relationship with Our Lady, you and I, at this Divine Mercy Conference where she has come to gather us, we can lay our chest, our hearts against the heart of Our Lady. Her heart beats only out of love for God. Allow the rhythm of her heart restore the rhythm of your life. Who has taken your peace? Who has disturbed your life? In these moments, in these days of grace, we can find that peace. The peace that Our Lady offers is the peace that only God can give. It's a peace that restores, that heals, that renews, that strengthens us and gives us the courage to go back into situations that haven't changed when we left. We go back because we've changed. We go back at peace and able to see things as God sees things with the eyes of our hearts. After I had shared with the students in the school that day, I was asked, as I began to share earlier, would I go in next door to the five-year-olds? I was terrified. I think I was as terrified to go into them as I was to come up onto this stage today. (laughs) I sat on the floor. My sister works with children, and she always said, make yourself smaller with kids. They won't be afraid of you. So I sat on the floor, and I looked at all these little angel faces, and I said, has anybody here ever seen Our Lady? I didn't know where else to start about apparitions and visionaries. And as soon as I said, has anybody here ever seen Our Lady, 26 hands went straight up in (laughs) it. Sir, sir. I now had 26 visionaries in front of me. So I said, well, I better ask. 
So I started with the first visionary and I moved right along the 26 little faces. I saw my Holy Mary when my granny was sick. I saw St. Joseph when my granddad died. I saw Padre Pio when my granddad was in hospital. They all had something huge that they didn't understand and they connected it with these apparitions that they had had. There was one boy up the front and every time somebody said they saw a saint, so did I. And at the end, he put up his hand, and I saw God as well, he said, so. <laughs> I couldn't disagree with him. So I, t I gave them a little talk about Medjugorje, yeah? and I just said, I know six young people who've seen Our Lady every day. No problem. <laughs> We've seen her too. <laughs> and at the end, I said, now, close your eyes, and we'll tell Our Lady we love her. What I had pictured was to, for them to close their eyes and picture the last time you saw Holy Mary or Padre Pio or God or Jesus and we'll tell them we love them. I didn't get that far. As soon as I said we'll close our eyes and we'll tell Our Lady we love her, a little girl up the front sat straight up and she said, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And the other 25 joined her. I was stunned. To a five-year-old, how do you tell Our Lady you love her? You say the Hail Mary. That's all. <laughs> that applause is actually for yourself. Because today we have said to Mary, in our rosary, in the first part of the Hail Mary, I love you. I honor you as my mother, as the mother of God. And in the second part of the Hail Mary, Our Lady honors us. Imagine, she who is the cause of our joy, when we pray the Hail Mary, we become the cause of her joy. Because in the second part of the Hail Mary, Our Lady says to you and I, I will pray for you. I will pray for you now until the hour of your death. That is a promise Our Lady makes in every Hail Mary we offer her. That is the gift that you and I are to her. We are people in search of God, in need of God, but it doesn't end with us. Our coming to this conference is the beginning of our walk with Mary, as Pope John Paul invited us. It's the beginning of our journey with her to bring God to those who are searching for him too, to a place of peace, to be at peace. And I want to finish for you just to give you one last story. Um, I guided a group of pilgrims many, many, many years ago when I started guiding. They were in Medjugorje by accident. There were six couples. They were in fact not in Medjugorje as pilgrims. They were there as tourists. They came up from the coast to have a look around. The war was just starting, so the men didn't want the women to go on their own. How brave they were. Six Irish men against the Yugoslav army. But that's the excuse that the men had for coming to Medjugorje. It was to protect the wives, not to pray. But they had come because of one couple within that group. This couple's son had been killed exactly that week, one year earlier. He was killed in a car accident. His neck was broken and he died instantly. I didn't know this. When I bumped into them in the cafe, they were as rude as you can imagine. And the comment was, who the, are you? And how do you stick it here? It was raining, it was cold, they were miserable, they'd done nothing, they'd seen nothing. And I thought they were my pilgrims and they were making it clear, we're not pilgrims. So I said, would you like to do something? And the women said yes before the men even could say no or think no. And a short time later, we found ourselves at a small grotto known as the Blue Cross, a place of apparitions of Our Lady at the bottom of the hill. I tried to share a little with them, but I too had had serious back accident. I've had four spinal surgeries and I was in a body brace at the time. So we're freezing cold, it's pouring rain, and I shouldn't have been wet, but I didn't want them to leave Medjugorje with nothing. So I shared a little at the Blue Cross, 
And then I said, would you like to say a decade of the rosary? And I started the decade and nobody answered. I nearly died. It was the longest decade of my life. (laughs) Because it's raining and it's cold and would you ever finish? I finished the decade of the rosary. And I read the message of Our Lady. And when I turned to go back down to the taxis that were waiting for us, I saw one of the couples was very upset. It was the couple whose son had been killed. And I went down to the taxi and I thought they would walk with me, but they didn't arrive down for 20 minutes. And when they finally came down, there was total silence. But the men were almost carrying this man. You know that cry that us men, Irish men have, it comes from the bottom of our stomach. He didn't know how to cry. He was sobbing. He was broken. And nobody spoke. We said goodbye at the church and off they went. And by an extraordinary moment of God's providence, I I bumped into them at the airport. And he called me aside. And with the finger and the look, I thought, oh God. (laughs) He got the flu at the Blue Cross. (laughs) I need to talk to you, he said. And then he started to tell me, shaking, what happened to him at the Blue Cross. He said, he told me that his son had died. When my son died, everything died. You can keep your God who can take my son. I don't want to know a God who can take my John. He locked his son's bedroom door and it had not been opened. His relationship with his wife It was over, he said. The holiday was to hopefully... Who knows, he said. My kids don't talk to me. I've lost everything. And at the Blue Cross, he stood back from us all. And he said in one moment he felt somebody put a jacket on his shoulders. And he thought it was his wife putting a rain jacket on him. Which he said, when I think of that now, she wasn't even talking to me. (laughs) Why would she give me a jacket? So I I turned to move her away. Nothing. She wasn't near me. So he said, I I turned back again. And in a split second, he said, I felt this jacket again wrap itself around me. And he said, I felt the most extraordinary warmth and a peace. And it went right through my body. I was so angry. Something Father Joe said earlier. He said, I was so angry, even my hands heart and he said I felt a peace that I never thought I would ever know again and I did what I did not want to do for the rest of my life I started once again to cry but this was different he said I didn't say the decade I couldn't pray and they went back to the hotel on the coast I brought them all to our bedroom that night I opened a bottle of whiskey I had to use everybody to tell my wife what happened because I knew she wouldn't listen to me if it was just the two of us. He shared in the room what happened. All he wanted to do was go back to Medjugorje from the coast and get an explanation, find something that would explain what happened. The peace, okay, a moment. It was the warmth, he said. It filled me from head to toe and I needed to know what it was. And I just said, I think you know. And strangely, he hugged me, and off he went. And I was on holiday with my brother a few years ago in a certain part of Ireland, and didn't I hear this yell? It was him. He owned a shop in the street, and we had just walked past it. Are you Philip from... And we sat and spoke, and he filled all the blanks in, and the the story I've shared with you now. And I was back there a few years ago, visiting a neighbor of his, and I went in to visit him. I didn't know, but he was dying. He was lying on a bed. He had a disease where the nerves in his body were all raw. You couldn't touch him. He was on an airbed. He was in mortal agony. And he lay there smiling. And he said to me, Oh God, it's you. (laughs) Do you remember that decade we didn't say, he said. And he pointed to the statue of Our Lady of Knock on his mantelpiece and he said can we say that take it now and pointing at the statue and almost to himself he said I don't know what I would have done without her 
and we said the decade and a few weeks later I was at his funeral his heartbroken wife and his heartbroken family grieving the dad and the husband they loved when Our Lady intervened in his life at the Blue Cross she needed only a few seconds she brought into his life the peace that only God can give it's the peace she offers you and me in a situation that seems impossible. Everything is possible. We have opened our hearts. We are here with open hearts. We are here to confess with our hearts. This is a happy day as we started this conference with. And I want to thank you for the privilege to share today with you. And if we can finish with the Hail Mary before uh, the guys sing like a choir of angels to us we say that Hail Mary like those five year olds carry the one problem, the one burden the one person that has broken the rhythm or situation of your life put your heart under the heart of Mary and say to her I love you Hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. Thank you.